everybody. Good to see you all out. Happy Easter to everybody. We are in Joshua chapter 9, and we had just, uh, last week we've set up the, the Gibeonite deception. All right, so we've seen this reaction from um, this coalition of kings who are in the hill country and along the coast, um, made up of these nations. Now, they are going to come together and fight against Israel. So that's their reaction um, whenever they hear about what has happened. But whenever the inhabitants of Gibeon heard about what had happened, specifically what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they have a very different plan. And what's, what's their idea? What are they going to do? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they are going to pretend that they are worn out travelers from a faraway place for what purpose? What are they ultimately trying to get? A covenant with Israel. And why do they want a covenant with Israel? They don't want to die. That's a pretty good motive for a lot of things, right? <laughs> that motivates people. I don't want to die, and so here's what I'm going to do. Um, and so we've read about the deception. Um, and so they have just flat out lied to Israel. Um, in what way did Israel fall short in their response, the way that they addressed the situation? Yeah, they didn't consult with the Lord. They just took the evidence at face value and said, oh yeah, there's all this old stuff here. So the, you know, the men took some of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel from the Lord. And so, ultimately, Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And of course, what is the problem with that? What's the problem with Joshua making that covenant? Yeah, the, the law explicitly prohibits them from forming a covenant with these people because we learn that the, uh, the Gibeonites uh, belong to the Hivites. Um, and the law specifically prohibits Israel from making a covenant with the Hivites. But Israel makes a covenant with the Hivites. All right, so everything looks really bad at this point. Based on what we have seen already from the book of Joshua, what do we expect the Lord's response to be? What has the Lord's response been in the book of Joshua whenever Israel uh, does something it's not supposed to do? It gets real bad. I mean, we're talking specifically about Achan. Right? And it, there's a connection here because Achan's sin is he takes from the, the dedicated goods. The harem. Right, but what we know is that the people are also harem. Right? They are also to be dedicated to destruction. And so Israel is essentially just entered into Achan's sin again. Right? Because Achan had taken from the harem and kept the harem, um, and that caused all Israel to break faith with the Lord. And so Israel punishes, or sorry, the Lord punishes all Israel in Joshua chapter 7. Now you have this people, the Gibeonites, who are also supposed to be Cherem. They are to be dedicated to destruction, and Israel has formed a covenant with them. Based on what we've already seen, we think the Lord's reaction is going to be really bad for Right, that Israel is going to, there's going to be punishment to go around. Uh, that probably something really bad is going to happen to Gibeon. But first, something really bad is probably going to happen to Israel. Right, so I want us to pay attention as we go along and see where the story goes. Uh, and see if we figure out what the, what the bad response is. Uh, Wayne, I saw your hand before we jump into today's text. It, it, it goes a long way to say there's a threat which begins in Genesis and runs all the way through Revelation 
Uh -huh. is consistent every single solitary time, without exception. Well, I'm going to say without exception. Okay. But usually, if God speaks and we don't listen, uh -huh. there's death following. Yeah, that almost well, always happens. Way, there's death to be called that. And yeah. it's, a, it's a severe consequence. Yes. God yeah. listen to God. And I think, I think that is worth bearing in mind as we read through this text. That whenever, um, and especially we see this in the Old Testament, but it's, it's repeated in the New Testament as well. It is a Genesis to Revelation principle. Whenever God speaks and we ignore him, it leads to death. All right, so let's see where it leads as we read through Joshua. So we're going to start in Joshua chapter 9, verse 16. At the end of three days, after they had made a covenant with them, they heard that they were neighbors and that they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Hephira, Birot, and Kiriat Yarim. But the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Then all the congregation murmured against the leaders. But all the leaders said to the congregation, We have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. And the leaders said to them, Let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said to them. All right, so now we've got an interesting reversal of things. In this chapter so far, we've heard about the, uh, this coalition of kings. They have heard what's going on, and they react by forming this coalition to attack. The Gibeonites have heard what Joshua did to Jericho and Ai. They react. Now it is Israel that is hearing. At the end of the three days after they'd made a covenant with them, they heard that they were na their neighbors and that they lived among them. <coughs> Excuse me. And what is the people's response? Right After the people of Israel set out and they reach the cities of the Gibeonites, what is their response? Um, but first off, Let's start with the, the leaders of the people. Um, do they attack Gibeon? No. Now, the common people of Israel, the congregation of Israel, what is their reaction to what is going on? What's the text say that the congregation does? They complain. They murmur. I think the, the ESV has done a good job translating that word in that way. The congregation murmured against the leaders. Is this particular word for what they are doing only appears here, and we should recognize it also from Exodus and Numbers. Because we read about the people of Israel murmuring a lot in those books. Uh, what are they? What kinds of things do they murmur about in Exodus and Numbers? Sorry, I heard two people at once. Food, water. Yeah, they they're grumbling, they're complaining, and are they at least in those instances? Are they in the right or in the wrong? I mean, they're always in the wrong in those instances. It is not meant to portray Israel in a good light. They are grumbling and complaining. And here we find them murmuring against the leaders. Again, we only find this particular verb in these two, uh, these two contexts, here in Joshua and then back in the wilderness wandering. Yes. 
as long as things were thing right here in verse uh, 7, uh -huh. they were the ones that said, you know, perhaps you can call among us so that we can have a covenant with you. But it was the people that really said that before Joshua did. Yeah. Uh, wanting to get these people to come into their community. Yeah. And now that they're here, you know, hey, you, you tricked us. This is not what we wanted. Yes, there is a certain about face that's going on among the people here. Yeah, that they they do kind of want things both ways. Uh, and, and part of that, I think, is, and I think you're good to note that, that in verse 7, their reaction. Um, and there's also, they've, they've got some motive ahead of time for letting these foreigners in because of what we read in verse 21. All right, the leader said to them, let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said of them. All right, we're going to read this portion of the law later on, um, because this is not the, the last time that we hear about them becoming cutters of wood and drawers of water. Um, but there is a provision in the law that that's generally what foreigners are supposed to do. Um, that Israel, whenever they allow foreigners into the congregation, they basically act as servants. Um, for Israel. And so there's some motive for Israel to allow these people in. Oh, we've got a potential labor source here. Until they figure out what that labor source is, and then all of a sudden, oh, they, these leaders of ours making these bad decisions. So they are murmuring. All right, the text does not put them in a good light. In fact, twice now the text has not put them in a good light because now they're in the same position that the Canaanites had been in, hearing and reacting. And now they are murmuring. What is, what's the leader's response to them? All right, so the congregation murmurs against the leaders. Why would you make this covenant? Um, what are the leaders going to do? What's their response? All right. Yeah. And now, yeah, now we might consider ourselves to be between a rock and a hard place. Because now you've got two things working in this. What's Israel supposed to do with these people? They're supposed to destroy them. But they have sworn this covenant. Would it have been better for them to renounce the covenant and kill the Gibeonites? The law covers both things, by the way. Are you supposed to form covenants with people and break them? No. <laughs> Rena? But also, from what you told us, you know, uh -huh. a few weeks ago with Rahab, that they were merciful and people were going to join them. Mm hmm. That's true. Yeah, they are offered some honest employment. And in fact, we're going we're gonna to focus on that a little more later on because there is something to that. Because um, it's not just that they cut wood and draw water, but they're going to do it in a specific context in a specific way. So we're going to hold on to that detail for just a minute. Um, Wayne, go ahead. Yeah, well, and it's, it's a very serious thing. It is. Um, it's a serious thing in the law uh, to not uphold your word, to swear a covenant falsely and break it. And it was also just a big deal in antiquity because uh, this is, remember, Israel also has a reputation. We have been reading all through the book of Joshua that the nations around them have been hearing about them and what they've been doing. Right? They are going to hear about the outcome of this. In fact, that's going to be the subject of the very next chapter. The people are going to hear about what has happened between Israel and Gibeon. Uh, and we've got a couple of, you know, Israel's got a couple of choices in front of them. Um, 
What do they want to be known as? Do they want to be known as the, the people who faithfully keep their covenants? Or do they want to be known as the people who drop their covenants once they figure out that the covenant uh, doesn't fit in whatever way? Again, you're a, a Canaanite. Well, I don't know. Some of the Canaanites might understand I think, why Israel would be reluctant to form a covenant. I mean, there's, there's a fact. There's a reason why Gibeon engaged in this deception to begin with. They seem to understand that Israel's general policy is not to make covenants with Canaanites. Uh, otherwise, they would just come to Israel and say, hey, uh, we give up, make a covenant with us. They understood, at least to some degree, uh, they had motive to, to lie about who they were and to fool Israel into thinking that they were just some other foreigners from some other place. Um, but the people around them are going to hear about how they react to this and how they respond. All right, but the leaders, um, the leaders say we have sworn to them, and by the way, this is not just their own word, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. And now we may not touch them. If they break their covenant, it doesn't just entail going back on their own word. They've also implicated God in this. Because they have sworn by the Lord to have mercy on them and let them live among them. Uh, so, I don't, again, this puts them in a very difficult place. So, so, the situation is they didn't know that these people were Hivites. Because they didn't consult the Lord about it. Yeah. Okay. And then they made that covenant. Yep. Which, so far, that's okay, right? They can do that out of ignorance, right? Even though they didn't mm -hmm. consult Uh -huh. So they followed the principles of the law if they were dealing with a non-Canaanite people. Right? Because the law tells them that they can form covenants with outside nations. Um, and what they've done has followed the pattern that's laid out in the law. Um, that if, if people surrender to them, they are to take them in and allow them to be servants within the congregation of Israel. But the important thing um, is that the Gibeonites are not part of those outside nations. They are part of the condemned nations living within the promised land that God has told them to utterly destroy and make no covenant with. So, and that's, that's what puts Israel between a rock and a hard place here, is that on the one hand, they have invoked the Lord's name in swearing this covenant that they will let the men of Gibeon live. On the other hand, on the other side, you've got the commandment in the law that they shall not let these people live. And now, how's that going to shake out? So they truly knew that these Gibeonites were Canaanites? Uh, no, they, they didn't know. They acted in ignorance, but it was self-inflicted ignorance. Yeah, even though they were ignorant, it's still bad in the sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I do think it's, yeah, I think it is important to consider what their motives are. Um, so let's, I mean, let's file that away as we consider what, uh, like, where the text is going to go. Right? Because Israel, Israel does not intend to break the law, but they also don't do the things that are necessary to make sure that they keep the law. And in most cases, we would not say that that ignorance justifies what they've done, right? Yeah? I'm great. I don't know about this part, but what, was there a, a way that they could tell what kind of people they were? I mean, like, mm -hmm. the color of their skin, the slant of their eyes, the language? It would normally be... Was there a way that they could tell who was who and who was what? It would normally be clothing. Um, okay. Language was another big one. Um, but the big marker in antiquity was clothing. Uh, so they... Yeah, I mean, they have... Yeah, so the only thing that we're told about their clothes is that they change into clothes that are worn out. And for whatever reason, Israel doesn't recognize them by sight as, hey, these are Hivites. Uh, 
So, I mean, that's, that's part of the deception. Uh, and again, they, just looking at what they have in front of them, you know, taking from the provisions, they buy the store. Uh, so there's, as far as the text tells us, there's, there's not anything that we would think, oh, if Israel had just been paying better attention, they should have been able to figure this out. The key thing is they didn't ask counsel for the Lord. Uh, and that's the, that's the major transgression of this passage. All right, so let's, let's read on and see how this shakes out. Verse 22. Joshua summoned them, and he said to them, Why did you deceive us, saying, We are very far from you, when you dwell among us? Now, therefore, you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. And now, behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your sight to do to us, do it. So he did this to them and delivered them out of the hand of the people of Israel, and they did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place that he should choose. All right, so this whole episode is about Joshua confronting the Gibeonites about what they've done. He accuses them of deception, right? So there's no bones about it. You deceived us. And they don't object to this charge, by the way. When Joshua asks, why did you deceive us? The Gibeonites don't come back and say, oh, no, no, we, we weren't lying. You know, here's some technicality. We were technically telling the truth. No, I mean, they, they don't object to that at all. So Joshua has accused them, and that accusation stands, that they are deceived. This is, by the way, uh, the same crime that Laban perpetrates on uh, Jacob in Genesis 29-25. The same word is being used there for deceive. Um, if Jacob asks Laban, why did you deceive me and send in your other daughter? Um, all right, so that's a mark against Gibeon. And then there's the, the matter of the punishment. Now, therefore, you are cursed. Do we consider that to be a positive thing? <laughs> that uh, it seems to me rather to be a mark against the Gibeonites. That Joshua pronounces a curse on them. Now here's an interesting thing. All right, we, we've seen Joshua lay down another curse in this book on the city of Jericho. What was that curse? It remind me of the curse of Jericho. Y'all remember what Joshua said? You know? It would never be built again, and if somebody tried it, what would happen? They would set up the walls and the gates at the expense of their own sons. Right? You try to rebuild this city, and God's going to kill your kids. And we read later in the Old Testament, later in Israel's history, that that's precisely what happened. There was a guy who tried to rebuild Jericho, and his kids died for it. Um... And the text cites right back to what Joshua said. So Joshua has the authority and the power to lay down curses. Um, and as we saw with that last curse, it's a pretty devastating curse. You're going to lose your kids for this. So Joshua has the authority to lay down this curse. And it is a, a curse that we would expect to be binding. What's the nature of the curse? What's going to happen to Gideon? They are going to be cutters of wood and jars of water. I want you to notice something that Joshua says here. He doesn't say, you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and jars of water. He says, some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and jars of water. So some of them, not all of them, are going to remain servants throughout the rest of their history. And they are going to be specifically drawers of wood and cutters of water. They are going to be servants for Israel. Now, I alluded to this point in the law earlier. Let's go ahead and read it. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 20. 
All right, when we said uh, earlier that as far as Israel knew, they were obeying the law. This is the kind of thing that we're talking about. Okay, this Israel's motive in making the covenant uh, that they made was done, I think, with this law in mind. Deuteronomy 20, verse 10. When you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it, and if it responds to you peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. But if it makes no peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, you shall put all its males to the sword, but the women and the little ones, the livestock and everything else in the city, all its spoil, you shall take as plunder for yourselves. And you shall enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you, which are not cities of the nations here, but in the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites, which is relevant here, and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods. And so you sin against the Lord your God. All right, so the curse is that Gibeon is going to, they're going, at least some of them, will always be servants. All right, how is Israel supposed to treat foreigners whom they conquer in faraway cities? Make them servants. So the curse so far is that Gibeon is going to be treated as though they were people from a faraway place. But Rena, I saw your hand. Although, from what I've read in the Bible, they also were charged to treat them humanely. Yes, they are. Yes, they absolutely are. Um, that's something. We, we had a big, long study on the law of Moses. And there are a lot of laws offering unique protections to servants. Uh, in the law of Moses that you don't find in any of the other ancient law codes. Um, so yeah, this is not a, an invitation to abuse. Um, it is just, uh, this is the way that these foreigners are going to live among Israel, that they are going to be servants. Uh, now, but here's the interesting thing. Even in this very law that we just read, a distinction is made between the nations that are far away and the condemned nations. Um, you know, the, the six that are named there in the passage, including the Hivites. All right, and so again, the law says that these, the people of these nations are to be devoted to complete destruction. It's only the foreigners that you're supposed to accept as servants and put to forced labor. And Joshua's curse on Gibeon is that Gibeon is to be treated as faraway foreigners and not as Hivites. That's kind of interesting for a curse, isn't it? That's a curse that doesn't really strike you as a curse. The curse is that Gibeon is going to be treated better than the law says that they're supposed to be treated, which is interesting. We're going to continue on with that. Blaine? Yeah. Uh, everything was done by hand. Everything by and hand. The cutters were cool. wood to be not only just cut the wood, but thrown on the trees too. And yes. all that was done with an axe. Yes. If you think about it, you know, striking wood, some of those logs were very thin, trying to cut that thing in two, that's very, very hard for us later. It is extremely it's difficult. No. Yes. It is. It's not easy labor. But you want to know what the upside is to that hard labor? You're not dead while you're doing it. Not yet, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, cutting trees, there's a pretty good chance that you might end up that way. Um, but again, it is a, at least at this point, it's a curse that doesn't really strike us like a curse. Uh, but I want us to dig into this a little further. Joshua says, Some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood, and drawers of water, for 
He names a specific context in which they are to serve. The house of my God. And we read towards the end of the chapter, but in verse 27, Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord. So these people are not only servants, but they are they're tabernacle servants, temple servants. They're cutting wood specifically for the offering of you know the burnt offerings and the other sacrifices. But it also says for the congregation. Yes, for the congregation. Yes. There is a some of them are doing generalized work. There's also a special place for them as, as priestly servants. That not that they are priests, meaning that they serve the priests. And again, we have to ask, what kind of a curse is that? You know, if, if you were to tell me, I mean, let's, let's say, well, honestly, this is very much a gospel message <laughs> right here. Because what does God tell me about my sin? What does it deserve? Death, yeah. Death and hell. Wages of sin is death. And God says, well, you know what, Ad Kissin? Here's what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to let you go to church. <laughs> now, and, and imagine that he phrased that as a curse, right? Here's the curse. You're going to work at church. Okay. <laughs> if my options are death and hell... And working as a servant at the altar, guess which one I'm going to pick? Every day of the week and twice on Sunday, right? Um, again, it's a, it is a curse that does not strike as a curse. Uh, I want us to consider another couple of places from the law before we wrap up real quick. Um, their position as servants in Israel offers them some benefits. Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 29. We're going to start in verse 1. And you're going, we're going to notice something specifically about cutters of wood and drawers of water. Deuteronomy 29 verse 1. These are the words of the covenant that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab besides the covenant that he had made with them at Horeb. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs and those great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. I've led you 40 years in the wilderness... Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn off your feet. Interesting connection to Gibeon here, by the way. You have not eaten bread, and you have not drunk wine or strong drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came to this place, Sihon the king of Heshbon and Og the king of Bashan came out against us to battle, but we defeated them. We took their land and gave it for an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of the Manassites. Therefore... Keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. You are standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God. The heads of your tribes, your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourner who is in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today, that He may establish you today as His people, and that He may be your God as He promised you, and as He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. It is not with you alone that I am making this sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here with us today before the Lord our God, and with whoever is not here with us today. All right, so Moses is proclaiming the blessings of the covenant to Israel in perpetuity, right? This is for, it's for them and for their sons forever. But look at who gets wrapped up in that. Who gets to be part of the covenant blessings that God gives to Israel? Whom, you know, who gets to be part of the people that God claims? It also includes the sojourner who's in your camp from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water. 
Right, right, there's, there's some really big implications about this covenant that Israel has made with Gibeah. Uh, like we said, it doesn't just implicate Israel in it. They've implicated God in it. And it's not just that his name is attached to it, you know, that they've sworn by the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. It's that by inviting them in to covenant with themselves, they are also inviting these people into this covenant. And so part of what happens to Gibeon is that as a result of this curse, that they will, at least some of them, will always be servants for Israel, they're going to be implicated in this covenant. They're going to receive the blessings of this covenant. All right, that's where we're going to have to leave it there. Um, I want to start next Sunday... Uh, just by briefly considering the way the Gibeonites defend themselves. As they respond to Joshua. Um, and we're going to see something in that. But then there's still one more person who we have not seen speak about this whole situation. Who has not yet spoken about this whole situation? Joshua and I. God. We've not heard, we have not yet heard the word of the Lord on this. Israel didn't seek his counsel. And so far, he has not given it on us. Once we get into chapter 10, we're going to see the Lord's reaction to this entire situation. And we'll see where it goes. Um, and after we read through chapter 10, I also want us to consider some things that will happen later on in the Old Testament. And at that point, I think maybe we can make a good solid estimation of, well, what do we think about this whole situation with Israel and Gibeon? And did they do right uh, or did, you know, did things turn out the way they were supposed to turn out? Um, so, that'll be probably at least one more week's worth, maybe two more weeks' worth of work. So, look forward to it. Thank you so much for your kind attention and your questions and comments this morning. Let's head on out and greet everyone.